Chapter forty eight of Don Quixote, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Don Quixote, Volume two, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Chapter forty eight. Of what befell Don Quixote with Dona Rodriguez, the Duchess's duenna together with other occurrences worthy of record and eternal remembrance. Exceedingly moody and dejected was the sorely wounded Don Quixote, with his face bandaged and marked, not by the hand of God, but by the claws of a cat, mishaps incidental to knight-errantry. Six days he remained without appearing in public, and one night as he lay awake thinking of his misfortunes, and of Altisidora's pursuit of him, he perceived that some one was opening the door of his room with a key, and he at once made up his mind that the enamoured damsel was coming to make an assault upon his chastity and put him in danger of failing in the fidelity he owed to his lady Dulcinea del Toboso. No, said he, firmly persuaded of the truth of his idea, and he said it loud enough to be heard, the greatest beauty upon earth shall not avail to make me renounce my adoration of her whom I bear stamped and engraved in the core of my heart and the secret depths of my bowels. Be thou, lady mine, transformed into a clumsy country wench, or into a nymph of golden tagus weaving a web of silk and gold, let Merlin or Montesinos hold thee captive where they will. Where'er thou art, thou art mine, and where'er I am must be thine." The very instant he had uttered these words, the door opened. He stood up on the bed, wrapped from head to foot in a yellow satin coverlet, with a cap on his head, and his face and his mustaches tied up, his face because of the scratches, and his mustaches to keep them from drooping and falling down, in which trim he looked the most extraordinary scarecrow that could be conceived. He kept his eyes fixed on the door, and just as he was expecting to see the love-smitten and unhappy Altisidora make her appearance, he saw coming in a most venerable duenna, in a long white-bordered veil, that covered and enveloped her from head to foot. Between the fingers of her left hand she held a short-lighted candle, while with her right she shaded it to keep the light from her eyes, which were covered by spectacles of great size, and she advanced with noiseless steps, treading very softly. Don Quixote kept an eye upon her from his watch-tower, and observing her costume and noting her silence, he concluded that it must be some witch or sorceress that was coming in such a guise to work him some mischief, and he began crossing himself at a great rate. The spectre still advanced, and on reaching the middle of the room, looked up and saw the energy with which Don Quixote was crossing himself, and if he was scared by seeing such a figure as hers, she was terrified at the sight of his, for the moment she saw his tall yellow form with the coverlet and the bandages that disfigured him, she gave a loud scream, and exclaiming, Jesus, what's this I see? let fall the candle in her fright, and then finding herself in the dark, turned about to make off, but stumbling on her skirts in her consternation, she measured her length with a mighty fall. Don Quixote in his trepidation began saying, I conjure thee, phantom, or whatever thou art, tell me what thou art, and what thou wouldst with me. If thou art a soul in torment, say so, and all that my powers can do I will do for thee. For I am a Catholic Christian, and love to do good to all the world, and to this end I have embraced the order of knight-errantry to which I belong, the province of which extends to doing good even to souls in purgatory." The unfortunate duenna, hearing herself thus conjured, by her own fear guessed Don Quixote's, and in a low plaintive voice answered, Señor Don Quixote, if so be you are indeed Don Quixote, I am no phantom or spectre or soul in purgatory, as you seem to think, but Doña Rodriguez, duenna of honor to my lady the Duchess, and I come to you with one of those grievances your worship is wont to redress. Tell me, Senora Doña Rodriguez, said Don Quixote, do you perchance come to transact any go-between business? Because I must tell you I am not available for anybody's purpose, thanks to the peerless beauty of my lady Dulcinea del Toboso. 
In short, Senora Doña Rodriguez, if you will leave out and put aside all love messages, you may go and light your candle and come back, and we will discuss all the commands you have for me, and whatever you wish, saving only, as I said, all seductive communications. I carry nobody's messages, senor, said the duena. Little you know me. Nay, I'm not far enough advanced in years to take any such childish tricks. God be praised I have a soul in my body still, and all my teeth and grinders in my mouth, except one or two that the colds, so common in this Aragon country, have robbed me of. But wait a little while I go and light my candle, and I will return immediately and lay my sorrows before you as before one who relieves those of all the world. And without staying for an answer, she quitted the room and left Don Quixote tranquilly meditating while he waited for her. A thousand thoughts at once suggested themselves to him on the subject of this new adventure, and it struck him as being ill done and worse advised in him to expose himself to the danger of breaking his plighted faith to his lady, and said he to himself, Who knows but that the devil, being wily and cunning, may be trying now to entrap me with a duena, having failed with empresses, queens, duchesses, marchionesses, and countesses. Many a time have I heard it said by many a man of sense that he will sooner offer you a flat-nosed wench than a Roman-nosed one, and who knows but this privacy, this opportunity, this silence, may awaken my sleeping desires and lead me in these my latter years to fall where I have never tripped. In cases of this sort, it is better to flee than to await the battle, but I must be out of my senses to think and utter such nonsense." for it is impossible that a long, white-hooded, spectacled duena could stir up or excite a wanton thought in the most graceless bosom in the world. Is there a duena on earth that has fair flesh? Is there a duena in the world that escapes being ill-tempered, wrinkled, and prudish? Avant, then, ye duena crew, undelightful to all mankind. Oh, but that lady did well who, they say, had at the end of her reception room a couple of figures of duenas with spectacles and lace cushions, as if at work, and those statues served quite as well to give an air of propriety to the room as if they had been real duenas. So saying he leaped off the bed, intending to close the door and not allow Senora Rodriguez to enter. But as he went to shut it, Senora Rodriguez returned with a wax candle lighted, and having a closer view of Don Quixote, with the coverlet round him and his bandages and nightcap, she was alarmed afresh, and retreating a couple of paces, exclaimed, Am I safe, Sir Knight? For I don't look upon it as a sign of very great virtue that your worship should have got up out of bed. I may well ask the same, Senora, said Don Quixote, and I do ask whether I shall be safe from being assailed and forced. Of whom and against whom do you demand that security, Sir Knight? said the duena. Of you and against you I ask it, said Don Quixote, for I am not marble, nor are you brass, nor is it now ten o'clock in the morning, but midnight, or a trifle past it, I fancy, and we are in a room more secluded and retired than the cave could have been where the treacherous and daring Aeneas enjoyed the fair soft-hearted Dido. But give me your hand, Senora. I require no better protection than my own continence and my own sense of propriety, as well as that which is inspired by that venerable headdress. And so saying, he kissed her right hand and took it in his own, she yielding it to him with equal ceremoniousness. And here Cide Amete inserts a parenthesis in which he says that to have seen the pair marching from the door to the bed, linked hand in hand in this way, he would have given the best of the two tunics he had. Don Quixote finally got into bed, and Doña Rodriguez took her seat on a chair at some little distance from his couch, without taking off her spectacles or putting aside the candle. Don Quixote wrapped the bedclothes round him, and covered himself up completely, leaving nothing but his face visible, and as soon as they had both regained their composure, he broke silence, saying, now, Senor Doña Rodriguez, you may unbosom yourself and out with everything you have in your sorrowful heart and afflicted bowels, and by me you shall be listened to with chaste ears and aided by compassionate exertions. 
I believe it, replied the duenna. From your worship's gentle and winning presence only such a Christian answer could be expected. The fact is, then, Señor Don Quixote, that though you see me seated in this chair, here in the middle of the kingdom of Aragon, and in the attire of a despised outcast duenna, I am from the Asturias of Oviedo, and of a family with which many of the best of the province are connected by blood. But my untoward fate, and the improvidence of my parents, who, I know not how, were unseasonably reduced to poverty, brought me to the court of Madrid, where as a provision and to avoid greater misfortunes, my parents placed me as seamstress in the service of a lady of quality, and I would have you know that for hemming and sewing I have never been surpassed by any all my life. My parents left me in service, and returned to their own country, and a few years later went, no doubt, to heaven, for they were excellent good Catholic Christians. I was left an orphan with nothing but the miserable wages and trifling presents that are given to servants of my sort in palaces, but about this time, without any encouragement on my part, one of the esquires of the household fell in love with me, a man somewhat advanced in years, full-bearded and personable, and above all as good a gentleman as the king himself, for he came of a mountain stock. We did not carry on our loves with such secrecy but that they came to the knowledge of my lady, and she, not to have any fuss about it, had us married with the full sanction of the Holy Mother Roman Catholic Church, of which marriage a daughter was born, to put an end to my good fortune, if I had any. Not that I died in childbirth, for I passed through it safely and in due season, but because shortly afterwards my husband died of a certain shock he received, and had I time to tell you of it, I know your worship would be surprised. And here she began to weep bitterly, and said, Pardon me, Señor Don Quixote, if I am unable to control myself, for every time I think of my unfortunate husband, my eyes fill up with tears. God bless me, with what an air of dignity he used to carry my lady behind him on a stout mule as black as jet, for in those days they did not use coaches or chairs, as they say they do now, and ladies rode behind their squires. This much at least I cannot help telling you, that you may observe the good breeding and punctiliousness of my worthy husband. As he was turning into the Calle de Santiago in Madrid, which is rather narrow, one of the alcaldes of the court, with two alguaciles before him, was coming out of it, and as soon as my good squire saw him, he wheeled his mule about, and made as if he would turn and accompany him. My lady, who was riding behind him, said to him in a low voice, What are you about, you sneak? Don't you see that I am here? The alcalde, like a polite man, pulled up his horse and said to him, Proceed, senor, for it is I, rather, who ought to accompany my lady Doña Casilda, for that was my mistress's name. Still my husband, cap in hand, persisted in trying to accompany the alcalde, and seeing this my lady, filled with rage and vexation, pulled out a big pin, or rather, I think, a bodkin, out of her needle-case, and drove it into his back with such force that my husband gave a loud yell, and writhing fell to the ground with his lady. Her two lackeys ran to rise her up, and the alcalde and the alguaciles did the same. The Guadalajara gate was all in commotion, I mean the idlers congregated there. My mistress came back on foot, and my husband hurried away to a barber's shop, protesting that he was run right through the guts. The courtesy of my husband was noised abroad to such an extent that the boys gave him no peace on the street, and on this account, and because he was somewhat short-sighted, my lady dismissed him, and it was chagrin at this I am convinced beyond a doubt that brought on his death. I was left a helpless widow, with a daughter on my hands growing up in beauty like the sea-foam. At length, however, as I had the character of being an excellent needlewoman, my lady the duchess, then lately married to my lord the duke, offered to take me with her to this kingdom of Aragon, and my daughter also, and here, as time went by, my daughter grew up, and with her all the graces in the world. She sings like a lark, dances quick as thought, foots it like a gypsy, reads and writes like a schoolmaster, and does sums like a miser. Of her neatness I say nothing, for the running water is not purer, and her age is now, if my memory serves me, 
sixteen years, five months, and three days, one more or less. To come to the point, the son of a very rich farmer, living in the village of my lord the dukes, not very far from here, fell in love with this girl of mine, and, in short, how I know not, they came together, and under the promise of marrying her, he made a fool of my daughter, and will not keep his word. And though my lord the duke is aware of it, for I have complained to him, not once but many and many a time, and entreated him to order the farmer to marry my daughter, he turns a deaf ear, and will scarcely listen to me, the reason being that as the deceiver's father is so rich, and lends him money, and is constantly going security for his debts, he does not like to offend or annoy him in any way. Now, Señor, I want your worship to take it upon yourself to redress this wrong, either by entreaty or by arms. For by what all the world says, you came into it to redress grievances and right wrongs and help the unfortunate. Let your worship put before you the unprotected condition of my daughter, her youth, and all the perfections I have said she possesses. And before God and on my conscience, out of all the damsels my lady has, there is not one that comes up to the sole of her shoe, and the one they call Altisidora, and look upon as the boldest and gayest of them, put in comparison with my daughter, does not come within two leagues of her. For I would have you know, senor, all is not gold that glitters, and that same little Altisidora has more forwardness than good looks, and more impudence than modesty. Besides being not very sound, for she has such a disagreeable breath that one cannot bear to be near her for a moment, and even my lady the duchess, but I'll hold my tongue, for they say that walls have ears. For heaven's sake, Doña Rodriguez, what ails my lady the duchess? asked Don Quixote. Adjured in that way, replied the duena, I cannot help answering the question and telling the whole truth. Señor Don Quixote, have you observed the comeliness of my lady the duchess? that smooth complexion of hers like a burnished polished sword, those two cheeks of milk and carmine, that gay lively step with which she treads, or rather seems to spurn the earth, so that one would fancy she went radiating health wherever she passed? Well then, let me tell you, she may thank first of all God for this, and next, two issues that she has, one in each leg, by which all the evil humors, of which the doctors say she is full, are discharged." "'Blessed virgin!' exclaimed Don Quixote. "'And is it possible that my lady the Duchess has drains of that sort? "'I would not have believed it if the barefoot friars had told it me. "'But as the lady Doña Rodriguez says so, it must be so. "'But surely such issues, and in such places, "'do not discharge humors, but liquid amber. "'Verily, I do believe now that this practice of opening issues "'is a very important matter for the health. Don Quixote had hardly said this, when the chamber door flew open with a loud bang, and with the start the noise gave her, Doña Rodriguez let the candle fall from her hand, and the room was left as dark as a wolf's mouth as the saying is. Suddenly the poor duena felt two hands seize her by the throat, so tightly that she could not croak, while someone else, without uttering a word, very briskly hoisted up her petticoats, and with what seemed to be a slipper, began to lay on so heartily that any one would have felt pity for her. But although Don Quixote felt it, he never stirred from his bed, but lay quiet and silent, nay, apprehensive that his turn for a drubbing might be coming. Nor was the apprehension an idle one, for leaving the duena, who did not dare to cry out, well basted, the silent executioners fell upon Don Quixote, and stripping him of the sheet and the coverlet, they pinched him so fast and so hard that he was driven to defend himself with his fists, and all this in marvelous silence. The battle lasted nearly half an hour, and then the phantoms fled. Doña Rodriguez gathered up her skirts, and bemoaning her fate, went out without saying a word to Don Quixote, and he, sorely pinched, puzzled, and dejected, remained alone and there we will leave him, wondering who could have been the perverse enchanter who had reduced him to such a state. But that shall be told in due season, for Sancho claims our attention, and the methodical arrangement of the story demands it. End of chapter 48
Fifth of Don Quixote, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Don Quixote, Volume Two, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by John Ormsby. Chapter Forty Nine, of what happened Sancho in making the round of his island. We left the great governor angered and irritated by that portrait-painting rogue of a farmer who, instructed the major-domo, as the major-domo was by the duke, tried to practice upon him. He, however, fool, boor, and clown as he was, held his own against them all, saying to those around him and to Dr. Pedro Recio, who as soon as the private business of the duke's letter was disposed of had returned to the room, now I see plainly enough that judges and governors ought to be, and must be made of brass not to feel the importunities of the applicants that at all times and all seasons insist on being heard, and having their business dispatched, and their own affairs and no others attended to, come what may. And if the poor judge does not hear them and settle the matter, either because he cannot, or because that is not the time set apart for hearing them, forthwith they abuse him, and run him down, and gnaw at his bones, and even pick holes in his pedigree. You silly, stupid applicant, don't be in a hurry. Wait for the proper time and season for doing business. Don't come at dinner hour or at bedtime, for judges are only flesh and blood, and must give to nature what she naturally demands of them, all except myself, for in my case I give her nothing to eat, thanks to Señor Dr. Pedro Recio Tirte Afuera here, who would have me die of hunger, and declares that death to be life, and the same sort of life may God give him and all his kind. I mean the bad doctors, for the good ones deserve palms and laurels. All who knew Sancho Panza were astonished to hear him speak so elegantly, and did not know what to attribute it to, unless it were that office and grave responsibility either smarten or stupefy men's wits. At last Dr. Pedro Recio Agilers of Tirtia Fuera promised to let him have supper that night, though it might be in a contravention of all the aphorisms of Hippocrates. With this the governor was satisfied, and looked forward to the approach of night and supper-time with great anxiety, and though time, to his mind, stood still and made no progress, nevertheless the hour he so longed for came, and they gave him a beef salad with onions and some boiled calves feet rather far gone. At this he fell to with greater relish than if they had given him francolins from Milan, pheasants from Rome, veal from Sorrento, partridges from Moran, or geese from Lavajos, and turning to the doctor at supper, he said to him, Look here, senor doctor, for the future don't trouble yourself about giving me dainty things or choice dishes to eat, for it will be only taking my stomach off its hinges. It is accustomed to goat, cow, bacon, hung beef, turnips, and onions, and if by any chance it is given these palace dishes, it receives them squeamishly, and sometimes with loathing. What the head carver had best do is to serve me with what they call ollas podridas, and the rottener they are, the better they smell, and he can put whatever he likes into them, so long as it is good to eat, and I'll be obliged to him, and will requite him some day. But let nobody play pranks on me, for either we are or we are not. Let us live and eat in peace and good fellowship, for when God sends the dawn, he sends it for all. I mean to govern this island without giving up a right or taking a bribe. Let every one keep his eye open, and look out for the arrow. For I can tell him, the devil's in Cantillana, and if they drive me to it, they'll see something that will astonish them. Nay, make yourself honey, and the flies eat you. Of a truth, Senor Governor, said the carver, your worship is in the right of it in everything you have said, and I promise you in the name of all the inhabitants of this island that they will serve your worship with all zeal, affection, and good will, for the mild kind of government you have given a sample of to begin with, leaves them no ground for doing or thinking anything to your worship's disadvantage. That I believe, said Sancho, and they would be great fools if they did or thought otherwise. Once more I say, see to my feeding and my dapples, for that is the great point and what is most to the purpose. And when the hour comes, let us go the rounds, for it is my intention to purge this island of all manner of uncleanness and of all idle good-for-nothing vagabonds. For I would have you know that lazy idlers are the same thing in a state as the drones in a hive, that eat up the honey the industrious bees make. I mean to protect the husbandman, to preserve to the gentleman his privileges, to reward the virtuous, 
and above all to respect religion and honor its ministers. What say you to that, my friends? Is there anything in what I say, or am I talking to no purpose? There is so much in what your worship says, Senor Governor, said the Majordomo, that I am filled with wonder when I see a man like your worship, entirely without learning, for I believe you have none at all, say such things, and so full of sound maxims and sage remarks, very different from what was expected of your worship's intelligence by those who sent us or by us who came here. Every day we see something new in this world. Jokes become realities, and the jokers find the tables turned upon them. Night came, and with the permission of Dr. Pedro Recio, the governor had supper. They then got ready to go the rounds, and he started with the majordomo, the secretary, the head carver, the chronicler charged with recording his deeds, and alguaciles and notaries enough to form a fair-sized squadron. In the midst marched Sancho with his staff, as fine a sight as one could wish to see, and but a few streets of the town had been traversed when they heard a noise as of a clashing of swords. They hastened to the spot, and found that the combatants were but two, who seeing the authorities approaching stood still, and one of them exclaimed, Help in the name of God and the king! Are men to be allowed to rob in the middle of this town, and rush out and attack people in the very streets? Be calm, my good man, said Sancho, and tell me what the cause of this quarrel is, for I am the governor. Said the other combatant, Senor Governor, I will tell you in a very few words. Your worship must know that this gentleman has just now won more than a thousand reals in that gambling house opposite, and God knows how. I was there, and gave more than one doubtful point in his favor, very much against what my conscience told me. He made off with his winnings, and when I made sure that he was going to give me a crown or so, at least by way of a present, as it is usual and customary to give men of quality of any sort who stand by to see fair or foul play, and back up swindles and prevent quarrels, he pocketed his money and left the house. Indignant at this, I followed him, and speaking him fairly and civilly, asked him to give me if it were only eight reals, for he knows I am an honest man, and that I have neither profession nor property, for my parents never brought me up to any or left me any but the rogue, who is a greater thief than Cacus, and a greater sharper than Andradilla, would not give me more than four reals, so your worship may see how little shame and conscience he has. But by my faith, if you had not come up, I'd have made him disgorge his winnings, and he'd have learned what the range of the steel-yard was. What do you say to this? asked Sancho. The other replied that all his antagonist said was true, and that he did not choose to give him more than four reals, because he very often gave him money, and that those who expected presents ought to be civil and take what is given to them with a cheerful countenance, and not make any claim against winners unless they know them for certain to be sharpers and their winnings to be unfairly won, and that there could be no better proof that he himself was an honest man than his having refused to give anything, for sharpers always pay tribute to lookers-on who know them. That is true, said the majordomo. Let your worship consider what is to be done with these men. What is to be done, said Sancho, is this. You, the winner, be you good, bad, or indifferent, give this assailant of yours a hundred reals at once, and you must disperse thirty more to the poor prisoners, and you who have neither profession nor property, and hang about the island in idleness, take these hundred reals now, and some time of the day to-morrow quit the island under sentence of banishment for ten years, and under pain of completing it in another life if you violate the sentence, for I'll hang you in a gibbet, or at least the hangman will by my orders. Not a word from either of you, or I'll make him feel my hand. The one paid down the money, and the other took it, and the latter quitted the island, while the other went home. And then the governor said, Either I am not good for much, or I'll get rid of these gambling houses, for it strikes me they are very mischievous. This one at least, said one of the notaries, your worship will not be able to get rid of, for a great man owns it, and what he loses every year is beyond all comparison more than what he makes by the cards. On the minor gambling houses your worship may exercise your power, and it is they that do most harm and shelter the most barefaced practices. For in the houses of lords and gentlemen of quality, the notorious sharpers dare not attempt to play their tricks, and as the vice of gambling has become common, it is better that men should play in houses of repute than in some tradesmen's, where they catch an unlucky fellow in the small hours of the morning and skin him alive. I know already, notary, that there is a good deal to be said on that point, said Sancho. 
and now a tipstaff came along with a young man in its grasp and said, Senor Governor, this youth was coming towards us, and as soon as he saw the officers of justice, he turned about and ran like a deer, a sure proof he must be some evildoer. I ran after him, and had it not been that he stumbled and fell, I should never have caught him. What did you run for, fellow? said Sancho. To which the young man replied, Senor, it was to avoid answering all the questions officers of justice put. What are you by trade? A weaver. And what do you weave? Lance heads, with your worship's good leave. You're facetious with me. You plume yourself on being a wag? Very good. And where were you going just now? To take the air, senor. And where does one take the air on this island? Where it blows. Good. Your answers are very much to the point. You are a smart youth. But take notice that I am the heir, and that I blow upon you astern, and send you to jail. Ho there, lay hold of him and take him off. I'll make him sleep there to-night without air. By God, said the young man, your worship will make me sleep in jail just as soon as make me king. Why shan't I make thee sleep in jail, said Sancho? Have I not the power to arrest thee and release thee whenever I like? All the power your worship has, said the young man, won't be able to make me sleep in jail. How? Not able, said Sancho. Take him away at once where he'll see his mistake with his own eyes, even if the jailer is willing to exert his interested generosity on his behalf. For I'll lay a penalty of two thousand ducats on him if he allows him to stir a step from the prison. That's ridiculous, said the young man. The fact is, all the men on earth will not make me sleep in prison. Tell me, you devil, said Sancho, have you got any angel that will deliver you? and take off the irons I am going to order them to put upon you? Now, Senor Governor, said the young man in a sprightly manner, let us be reasonable and come to the point. Granted, your worship may order me to be taken to prison, and to have irons and chains put on me, and to be shut up in a cell, and may lay heavy penalties on the jailer if he lets me out, and that he obeys your orders. Still, if I don't choose to sleep, and choose to remain awake all night without closing an eye, Will your worship, with all your power, be able to make me sleep if I don't choose? No, truly, said the secretary, and the fellow has made his point. So then, said Sancho, it would be entirely of your own choice you would keep from sleeping, not in opposition to my will? No, senor, said the youth, certainly not. Well, then go, and God be with you, said Sancho. Be off home to sleep, and God give you sound sleep, for I don't want to rob you of it. But for the future, let me advise you don't joke with the authorities, because you may come across someone who will bring down the joke on your own skull. The young men went his way, and the governor continued his round, and shortly afterwards two tipstaffs came up with a man in custody and said, Senor Governor, this person, who seems to be a man, is not so, but a woman, and not an ill-favored one, in man's clothes. They raised two or three lanterns to her face, and by their light they distinguished the features of a woman to all appearance of the age of sixteen or a little more, with her hair gathered into a gold and green silk net, and fair as a thousand pearls. They scanned her from head to foot, and observed that she had on red silk stockings with garters of white taffety, bordered with gold and pearl. Her breeches were of green and gold stuff, and under an open jacket or jerkin of the same she wore a doublet of the finest white and gold cloth. Her shoes were white and such as men wear. She carried no sword at her belt, but only a richly ornamented dagger, and on her finger she had several handsome rings. In short, the girl seemed fair to look at in the eyes of all, and none of those who beheld her knew her. The people of the town said they could not imagine who she was, and those who were in the secret of the jokes that were to be practiced upon Sancho were the ones who were the most surprised, for this incident or discovery had not been arranged by them, and they watched anxiously to see how the affair would end. Sancho was fascinated by the girl's beauty, and he asked her who she was, where she was going, and what had induced her to dress herself in that garb. She, with her eyes fixed on the ground, answered in modest confusion, I cannot tell you, senor, before so many people, what it is of such consequence to me to have kept secret. One thing I wish to be known, that I am no thief or evildoer, only an unhappy maiden whom the power of jealousy has led to break through the respect that is due to modesty. Hearing this, the majordomo said to Sancho, Make the people stand back, senor governor, that this lady may say what she wishes with less embarrassment. 
Sancho gave the order, and all except the majordomo, the head carver, and the secretary fell back. Finding herself in the presence of no more, the damsel went on to say, I am the daughter, sirs, of Pedro Perez Masorca, the wool farmer of this town, who is in the habit of coming very often to my father's house. That won't do, senora, said the majordomo, for I know Pedro Perez very well, and I know he has no child at all, neither son or daughter. And besides, though you say he is your father, you add then that he comes very often to your father's house. I already noticed that, said Sancho. I am confused just now, sirs, said the damsel, and I don't know what I am saying. But the truth is that I am the daughter of Diego de la Llana, whom you must all know. Ay, that will do, said the majordomo, for I know Diego de la Llana, and I know he is a gentleman of position and a rich man, and that he has a son and a daughter, and that since he was left a widower, nobody in all this town can speak of having seen his daughter's face, for he keeps her so closely shut up that he does not give even the son a chance of seeing her, and for all that report says she is extremely beautiful. It is true, said the damsel, and I am that daughter, whether report lies or not as to my beauty, you, sirs, will have decided by this time, as you have seen me and with this she began to weep bitterly. On seeing this, the secretary leaned over to the head-carver's ear, and said to him in a low voice, Something serious has no doubt happened, this poor maiden, that she goes wandering from home in such a dress, and at such an hour, and one of her rank, too. There can be no doubt about it, returned the carver, and moreover her tears confirm your suspicion. Sancho gave her the best comfort he could, and entreated her to tell them without any fear what had happened to her, as they would all earnestly and by every means in their power endeavor to relieve her. The fact is, sirs, said she, that my father has kept me shut up these ten years, for so long as it is since the earth received my mother. Mass is said at home in a sumptuous chapel, and all this time I have seen but the sun in the heaven by day, and the moon and the stars by night. Nor do I know what streets are like, or plazas, or churches, or even men, except my father and a brother I have, and Pedro Perez the wool-farmer, whom, because he came frequently to our house, I took it into my head to call my father, to avoid naming my own. This seclusion and the restrictions laid upon my going out, were it only to church, have been keeping me unhappy for many a day and month past. I longed to see the world, or at least the town where I was born, and it did not seem to me that this wish was inconsistent with the respect maidens of good quality should have for themselves. When I heard them talking of bullfights taking place, and of javelin games, and of acting plays, I asked my brother, who is younger than myself, to tell me what sort of things these were, and many more that I had never seen. He explained them to me as well as he could, but the only effect was to kindle in me a still stronger desire to see them. At last, to cut short the story of my ruin, I begged and entreated my brother, oh, that I had never made such an entreaty, and once more she gave way to a burst of weeping. Proceed, senora, said the majordomo, and finish your story of what has happened to you, for your words and tears are keeping us all in suspense. I have but little more to say, though many a tear to shed, said the damsel, for ill-placed desires can only be paid for in some such way. The maiden's beauty had made a deep impression on the head-carver's heart, and he again raised his lantern for another look at her, and thought they were not tears she was shedding, but seed-pearl or dew of the meadow. Nay, he exalted them still higher, and made oriental pearls of them, and fervently hoped her misfortune might not be so great a one as her tears and sobs seemed to indicate. The governor was losing patience at the length of time the girl was taking to tell her story, and told her not to keep them waiting any longer, for it was late, and there still remained a good deal of the town to be gone over. She, with broken sobs and half-suppressed sighs, went on to say, My misfortune, my misadventure, is simply this, that I entreated my brother to dress me up as a man in a suit of his clothes, and take me some night, when our father was asleep, to see the whole town. He, overcome by my entreaties, consented, and dressing me in this suit, and himself in clothes of mine that fitted him as if made for him, for he has not a hair on his chin, and might pass for a very beautiful young girl, Tonight, about an hour ago, more or less, we left the house, and guided by our youthful and foolish impulse, we made a circuit of the whole town, and then, as we were about to return home, we saw a great troop of people coming, and my brother said to me, Sister, this must be the round, stir your feet and put wings to them, 
and follow me as fast as you can, lest they recognize us, for that would be a bad business for us. And so saying, he turned about and began, I cannot say to run, but to fly. In less than six paces I fell from fright, and then the officer of justice came up and carried me before your worships, where I find myself put to shame before all these people as whimsical and vicious. So then, Senora, said Sancho, no other mishap has befallen you, nor was it jealousy that made you leave home, as you said at the beginning of your story? Nothing has happened to me, said she, nor was it jealousy that brought me out, but merely a longing to see the world, which did not go beyond seeing the streets of this town. The appearance of the tipstaffs with her brother in custody, whom one of them had overtaken as he ran away from his sister, now fully confirmed the truth of what the damsel said. He had nothing on but a rich petticoat and a short blue damask cloak with fine gold lace, and his head was uncovered and adorned only with its own hair, which looked like rings of gold, so bright and curly was it. The governor, the majordomo, and the carver went aside with him, and, unheard by his sister, asked him how he came to be in that dress, and he, with no less shame and embarrassment, told exactly the same story as his sister, to the great delight of the enamoured carver. The governor, however, said to them, In truth, young lady and gentleman, this has been a very childish affair, and to explain your folly and rashness there was no necessity for all this delay and all these tears and sighs. For if you had said we are so-and-so, and we escaped from our father's house in this way in order to ramble about, out of mere curiosity and with no other object, there would have been an end of the matter, and none of these little sobs and tears and all the rest of it. That is true, said the damsel, but you see the confusion I was in was so great that it did not let me behave as I ought. No harm has been done, said Sancho. Come, we will leave you at your father's house. Perhaps they will not have missed you. And another time don't be so childish or eager to see the world, for a respectable damsel should have a broken leg and keep it home and the woman and the hen by gadding about are soon lost, and she who is eager to see is also eager to be seen. I say no more. The youth thanked the governor for his kind offer to take them home, and they directed their steps toward the house, which was not far off. On reaching it, the youth threw a pebble up at a grating, and immediately a woman servant who was waiting for them came down and opened the door to them, and they went in, leaving the party marvelling as much at their grace and beauty as at the fancy they had for seeing the world by night and without quitting the village, which, however, they had set down to their youth. The head carver was left with a heart pierced through and through, and he made up his mind on the spot to demand the damsel in marriage of her father on the morrow, making sure she would not be refused him as he was a servant of the duke's, and even to Sancho ideas and schemes of marrying the youth to his daughter Sanchica suggested themselves, and he resolved to open the negotiation at the proper season, persuading himself that no husband could be refused to a governor's daughter. And so the night's round came to an end, and a couple of days later the government, whereby all his plans were overthrown and swept away, as will be seen farther on. End of chapter 49「and fifty one of Don Quixote Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Don Quixote Volume two by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by William Ormsby. Chapter fifty wherein is set forth who the enchanters and executioners were who flogged the duena and pinched don quixote and also what befell the page who carried the letter to teresa panza sancho panza's wife cide amete the painstaking investigator of the minute points of this veracious history says that when doña rodriguez left her own room to go to don quixote's another duena who slept with her observed her and as all duenas are fond of prying, listening, and sniffing, she followed her so silently that the good Rodriguez never perceived it, and as soon as the duena saw her enter Don Quixote's room, not to fail in a duena's invariable practice of tattling, she hurried off that instant to report to the duchess how Doña Rodriguez was closeted with Don Quixote. The duchess told the duke and asked him to let her and Altisidora go and see what the said duena wanted with Don Quixote. The duke gave them leave, 
and the pair cautiously and quietly crept to the door of the room, and posted themselves so close to it that they could hear all that was said inside. But when the Duchess heard how the Rodriguez had made public the Aranjuez of her issues, she could not restrain herself, nor Altisidora either, and so, filled with rage and thirsting for vengeance, they burst into the room and tormented Don Quixote and flogged the duena in the manner already described, for indignities offered to their charms and self-esteem mightily provoke the anger of women and make them eager for revenge. The duchess told the duke what had happened, and he was much amused by it, and she, in pursuance of her design of making merry and diverting herself with Don Quixote, dispatched the page who had played the part of Dulcinea in the negotiations for her disenchantment, which Sancho Panza in the cares of government had forgotten all about, to Teresa Panza his wife, with her husband's letter and another from herself, and also a great string of fine coral beads as a present. Now the history says this page was very sharp and quick-witted, and eager to serve his lord and lady, he set off very willingly for Sancho's village. Before he entered it, he observed a number of women washing in a brook, and asked them if they could tell him whether there lived there a woman of the name of Teresa Panza, wife of one Sancho Panza, squire to a knight called Don Quixote of La Mancha. At the question, a young girl who was washing stood up and said, Teresa Panza is my mother, and that Sancho is my father, and that knight is our master. Well then, miss, said the page, Come and show me where your mother is, for I bring her a letter and a present from your father. That I will do with all my heart, senor, said the girl, who seemed to be about fourteen, more or less, and leaving the clothes she was washing to one of her companions, and without putting anything on her head or feet, for she was bare-legged and had her hair hanging about her, away she skipped in front of the page's horse, saying, Come, your worship, our house is at the entrance of the town, and my mother is there, sorrowful enough at not having had any news of my father this ever so long. Well, said the page, I am bringing her such good news that she will have reason to thank God. And then, skipping, running, and capering, the girl reached the town, but before going into the house she called out at the door, Come out, Mother Teresa, come out, come out. Here's a gentleman with letters and other things from my good father. At these words her mother Teresa Panza came out, spinning a bundle of flax, in a grey petticoat, so short was it one could have fancied they to her shame had cut it short, a grey bodice of the same stuff, and a smock. She was not very old, though plainly past forty, strong, healthy, vigorous, and sun-dried, and seeing her daughter and the page on horseback she exclaimed, "'What's this, child? What gentleman is this?' A servant of my lady, Doña Teresa Panza, replied the page, and suiting the action to the word he flung himself off his horse, and with great humility advanced to kneel before the lady Teresa, saying, Let me kiss your hand, Señora Doña Teresa, as the lawful and only wife of Señor Don Sancho Panza, rightful governor of the island of Barataria. Ah, Señor, get up, do that, said Teresa, for I'm not a bit of a court lady, but only a poor countrywoman, the daughter of a clod-crusher, and the wife of a squire errant, and not of any governor at all. You are, said the page, the most worthy wife of a most arch-worthy governor, and as proof of what I say, accept this letter and this present. And at the same time he took out of his pocket a string of coral beads with gold clasps, and placed it on her neck, and said, this letter is from his lordship the governor, and the other as well as these coral beads from my lady the duchess, who sends me to your worship. Teresa stood lost in astonishment, and her daughter just as much, and the girl said, May I die but our master Don Quixote is at the bottom of this. He must have given father the government or county he so often promised him. That is the truth, said the page for it is through Señor Don Quixote that Señor Sancho is now governor of the island of Barataria, as will be seen by this letter. Will your worship read it to me, noble sir? said Teresa. For though I can spin, I can't read, not a scrap. Nor I either, said Sanchica. But wait a bit, and I'll fetch someone who can read it, either the curate himself or the bachelor Samson Carrasco, and they'll come gladly to hear any news of my father." 
There is no need to fetch anybody, said the page, for though I can't spin, I can read, and I'll read it. And so he read it through, but as it has already been given, it is not inserted here. And then he took out the other one from the Duchess, which ran as follows. Friend Teresa, your husband Sancho's good qualities, of heart as well as of head, induced and compelled me to request my husband the Duke to give him the government of one of his many islands. I am told he governs like a gerfalcon, of which I am very glad, and my lord the duke, of course, also, and I am very thankful to heaven that I have not made a mistake in choosing him for that same government, for I would have Signora Teresa know that a good governor is hard to find in this world, and may God make me as good as Sancho's way of governing. Herewith I send you, my dear, a string of coral beads with gold clasps, I wish they were oriental pearls, but he who gives thee a bone does not wish to see thee dead. A time will come when we shall become acquainted and meet one another, but God knows the future. Commend me to your daughter Sanchica, and tell her from me to hold herself in readiness, for I mean to make a high match for her when she least expects it. They tell me there are big acorns in your village. Send me a couple of dozen or so, and I shall value them greatly as coming from your hand and write to me at length to assure me of your health and well-being. And if there be anything you stand in need of, it is but to open your mouth, and that shall be the measure, and so God keep you. From this place, your loving friend, the Duchess. Ah, what a good, plain, lowly lady, said Teresa when she heard the letter, that I may be buried with ladies of that sort, and not the gentlewomen we have in this town, that fancy because they are gentlewomen the wind must not touch them, and go to church with as much airs as if they were queens, no less, and seem to think they are disgraced if they look at a farmer's wife. And see here how this good lady, for all she's a duchess, calls me friend, and treats me as if I was her equal, and equal may I see her with the tallest church tower in La Mancha. And as for the acorns, senor, I'll send her ladyship a peck, and such big ones that one might come to see them as a show and a wonder. And now, Sanchica, see that the gentleman is comfortable. Put up his horse and get some eggs out of the stable, and cut plenty of bacon, and let's give him his dinner like a prince, for the good news he has brought, and his own bonny face deserve it all. And meanwhile I'll run out and give the neighbors the news of our good luck, and Father Curate and Master Nicholas the Barber, who are and always have been such friends of thy father's. That I will, mother, said Sanchica, but mind, you must give me half of that string, for I don't think my lady the duchess could have been so stupid as to send it all to you. It is all for thee, my child, said Teresa, but let me wear it round my neck for a few days, for verily it seems to make my heart glad. You will be glad too, said the page, when you see the bundle there is in this portmanteau, for it is a suit of the finest cloth, that the governor only wore one day out hunting, and now sends, all for Senora Sanchica. May he live a thousand years, said Sanchica, and the bearer as many, nay, two thousand if needful. With this Teresa hurried out of the house with the letters, and with the string of beads round her neck, and went along thrumming the letters as if they were a tambourine, and by chance coming across the curate and Samson Carrasco, she began capering and saying, None of us poor now, Faith. We've got a little government. Ay, let the finest fine lady tackle me, and I'll give her a setting down. What's all this, Teresa Panza? said they. What madness is this, and what papers are those? The madness is only this, said she, that these are the letters of duchesses and governors, and these I have on my neck are fine coral beads, with Ave Marias and paternosters of beaten gold, and I am a governess. God help us, said the curate. We don't understand you, Teresa, or know what you are talking about. There, you may see it yourselves, said Teresa, and she handed him the letters. The curate read them out for Samson Carrasco to hear, and Samson and he regarded one another with looks of astonishment at what they had read, and the bachelor asked who had brought the letters. Teresa, in reply, bade them come with her to her house, and they would see the messenger, a most elegant youth, who had brought another present which was worth as much more. The curate took the coral beads from her neck and examined them again and again, and having satisfied himself as to their fineness, he fell to wondering afresh, and said, 
By the gown I wear, I don't know what to say or think of these letters and presents. On the one hand, I can see and feel the fineness of these coral beads, and on the other, I read how a duchess sends to beg for a couple of dozen of acorns. Square that if you can, said Carrasco. Well, let's go and see this messenger, and from him we'll learn something about this mystery that has turned up. They did so, and Teresa returned with them. They found the page sifting a little barley for his horse, and Sanchica cutting a rasher of bacon to be paved with eggs for his dinner. His looks and his handsome apparel pleased them both greatly, and after they had saluted him courteously, and he them, Samson begged him to give them his news, as well of Don Quixote as of Sancho Panza, for, he said, though they had read the letters from Sancho and her ladyship the Duchess, they were still puzzled and could not make out what was meant by Sancho's government, and above all of an island, when all or most of those in the Mediterranean belonged to his majesty. To this the page replied, As to Señor Sancho Panza's being a governor, there is no doubt whatever, but whether it is an island or not that he governs, with that I have nothing to do. Suffice it that it is a town of more than a thousand inhabitants, with regard to the acorns, I may tell you my lady the duchess is so unpretending and unassuming that, not to speak of sending to beg for acorns from a peasant woman, she has been known to send to ask for the loan of a comb from one of her neighbors. For I would have your worships know that the ladies of Aragon, though they are just as illustrious, are not so punctilious and haughty as the Castilian ladies. They treat people with greater familiarity." In the middle of this conversation Sanchica came in with her skirt full of eggs, and she said to the page, Tell me, senor, does my father wear trunk hose since he has been governor? I have not noticed, said the page, but he no doubt wears them. Ah, my God, said Sanchica, what a sight it must be to have my father in tights. Isn't it odd that ever since I was born I have had a longing to see my father in trunk hose? As things go, you will see that if you live, said the page. By God, he is in the way to take the road with the sunshade if the government only lasts him two months more. The curate and the bachelor could see plainly enough that the page spoke in a waggish vein, but the fineness of the coral beads and the hunting suit that Sanchico sent, for Teresa had already shown it to them, did away with the impression, and they could not help laughing at Sanchico's wish, and still more when Teresa said, Senor Curate, look about if there's anybody here going to Madrid or Toledo to buy me a hooped petticoat, a proper fashionable one of the best quality. For indeed and indeed I must do honor to my husband's government as well as I can. Nay, if I am put to it and have to, I'll go to court and set a coach like all the world. For she who has a governor for her husband may very well have one and keep one. And why not, mother? said Sanchica. Would to God it were to-day instead of to-morrow, even though they were to say when they saw me seated in the coach with my mother, See that rubbish, that garlic-stuffed fellow's daughter, how she goes stretched at her ease in a coach as if she was a sheep-hope. But let them tramp through the mud, and let me go in my coach with my feet off the ground. Bad luck to backbiters all over the world. Let me go warm, and the people may laugh. Do I say right, mother? To be sure you do, my child, said Teresa, and all this good luck, and even more, my good Sancho foretold me, and thou wilt see, my daughter, he won't stop till he has made me a countess, for to make a beginning is everything in luck, and as I have heard thy good father say many a time, for besides being thy father, he's the father of Proverbs, too, when they offer thee a heifer, run with a halter, when they offer thee a government, take it, when they would give thee a county, seize it. When they say, hear, hear to thee with something good, swallow it. Oh no, go to sleep and don't answer the strokes of good fortune and the lucky chances that are knocking at the door of your house. And what do I care, added Sanchica, whether anybody says when he sees me holding my head up, the dog saw himself in hemp and breeches, and the rest of it. Hearing this, the curate said, I do believe that all this family of the Panzas are born with a sack full of proverbs in their insides, every one of them. I never saw one of them that does not pour them out at all times and on all occasions. That is true, said the page, for Señor Governor Sancho utters them at every turn, and though a great many of them are not to the purpose, still they amuse one, 
and my lady the duchess and the duke praise them highly. Then you still maintain that all this about Sancho's government is true, senor, said the bachelor, and that there actually is a duchess who sends him presents and writes to him? Because we, although we have handled the present and read the letters, don't believe it and suspect it to be something in the line of our fellow townsman Don Quixote, who fancies that everything is done by enchantment. And for this reason I am almost ready to say that I'd like to touch and feel your worship, to see whether you are a mere ambassador of the imagination, or a man of flesh and blood. All I know, sirs, replied the page, is that I am a real ambassador, and that Señor Sancho Panza is governor as a matter of fact, and that my lord and lady the duke and duchess can give, and have given him this same government, and that I have heard the said Sancho Panza bears himself very stoutly therein. Whether there be any enchantment in all this or not, it is for your worships to settle between you. For that's all I know by the oath I swear, and that is by the life of my parents whom I have still alive and love dearly. It may be so, said the bachelor, but dubitat Augustinus. Doubt who will, said the page. What I have told you is the truth, and that will always rise above falsehood as oil above water, if not operibus credite et non verbis. Let one of you come with me, and he will see with his eyes what he does not believe with his ears. It's for me to make that trip, said Sanchica. Take me with you, senor, behind you on your horse, for I'll go with all my heart to see my father. Governor's daughters, said the page, must not travel along the roads alone, but accompanied by coaches and litters and a great number of attendants. By God, said Sanchica, I can go as well mounted on a she-ass as in a coach. What a dainty lass you must take me for. Hush, girl, said Teresa, you don't know what you're talking about. The gentleman is quite right, for, as the time, so the behavior. When it was Sancho, it was Sancha. When it is governor, it's Senora. I don't know if I'm right. Senora Teresa says more than she is aware of, said the page, and now give me something to eat and let me go at once, for I mean to return this evening. Come and do penance with me, said the curate at this, for Senora Teresa has more will than means to serve so worthy a guest. The page refused, but had to consent at last for his own sake, and the curate took him home with him very gladly, in order to have an opportunity of questioning him at leisure about Don Quixote and his doings. The bachelor offered to write the letters in reply for Teresa, but she did not care to let him mix himself up in her affairs, for she thought him somewhat given to joking, and so she gave a cake and a couple of eggs to a young acolyte who was a penman, and he wrote for her two letters, one for her husband and the other for the duchess, dictated out of her own head, which are not the worst inserted in this great history, as will be seen farther on. Chapter 51 Of the Progress of Sancho's Government and Other Such Entertaining Matters Day came after the night of the governor's round, a night in which the head-carver passed without sleeping, so were his thoughts of the face and air and beauty of the disguised damsel, while the major-domo spent what was left of it in writing an account to his lord and lady of all Sancho said and did, being as much amazed at his sayings as at his doings, for there was a mixture of shrewdness and simplicity in all his words and deeds. The senor governor got up, and by Dr. Pedro Recio's directions, they made him break his fast on a little conserve and four sups of cold water, which Sancho would have readily exchanged for a piece of bread and a bunch of grapes. But seeing there was no help for it, he submitted with no little sorrow of heart and discomfort of stomach. Pedro Recio, having persuaded him that light and delicate diet enlivened the wits, and that was what was most essential for persons placed in command and in responsible situations, where they have to employ not only the bodily powers, but those of the mind also. By means of this sophistry, Sancho was made to endure hunger, and hunger so keen that in his heart he cursed the government, and even him who had given it to him. However, with his hunger and his concert, he undertook to deliver judgments that day, and the first thing that came before him was a question that was submitted to him by a stranger, in the presence of the major-domo and the other attendants, and it was in these words. Senor, a large river separated two districts of one and the same lordship. 
Will your worship please to pay attention, for the case is an important and a rather knotty one? Well, then, on this river there was a bridge, and at one end of it a gallows, and a sort of tribunal, where four judges commonly sat to administer the law which the lord of river, bridge, and the lordship had enacted, and which was to this effect. If any one crosses by this bridge from one side to the other, he shall declare an oath where he is going to, and with what object, and if he swears truly, he shall be allowed to pass, but if falsely, he shall be put to death for it by hanging on the gallows erected there, without any remission. Though the law and its severe penalty were known, many persons crossed, but in their declarations it was easy to see at once they were telling the truth, and the judges let them pass free. It happened, however, that one man, when they came to take his declaration, swore and said that by the oath he took he was going to die upon that gallows that stood there, and nothing else. The judges held a consultation over the oath, and they said, If we let this man pass free, he has sworn falsely, and by the law he ought to die. But if we hang him, as he swore he was going to die on that gallows, and therefore swore the truth, by the same law he ought to go free. It is asked of your worship, Signor Governor, what are the judges to do with this man? For they are still in doubt and perplexity, and having heard of your worship's acute and exalted intellect, they have sent me to entreat your worship on their behalf to give your opinion on this very intricate and puzzling case. To this Sancho made answer, Indeed, those gentlemen the judges that send you to me might have spared themselves the trouble, for I have more of the obtuse than the acute in me. But repeat the case over again, so that I may understand it, and then perhaps I may be able to hit the point. The querist repeated again and again what he had said before, and then Sancho said, It seems to me I can set the matter right in a moment, and in this way. The man swears that he is going to die upon the gallows, but if he dies upon it, he has sworn the truth, and by the law enacted deserves to go free and pass over the bridge. But if they don't hang him, then he has sworn falsely, and by the same law deserves to be hanged. It is as the Señor Governor says, said the messenger, and as regards a complete comprehension of the case, there is nothing left to desire or hesitate about. Well then I say, said Sancho, that of this man they should let pass the part that has sworn truly, and hang the part that has lied, and in this way the conditions of the passage will be fully complied with. But then, Señor Governor, replied the querist, the man will have to be divided into two parts, and if he is divided, of course he will die, and so none of the requirements of the law will be carried out, and it is absolutely necessary to comply with it. Look here, my good sir, said Sancho, Either I am a numbskull, or else there is the same reason for this passenger dying as for his living and passing over the bridge. For if the truth saves him, the falsehood equally condemns him. And that being the case, it is my opinion you should say to the gentleman who sent you to me, that as the arguments for condemning him and for absolving him are exactly balanced, they should let him pass freely, as it is always more praiseworthy to do good than to do evil. This I would give signed with my name if I knew how to sign." and what I have said in this case is not but of my own head, but one of the many precepts my master Don Quixote gave me the night before I left to become governor of this island that came into my mind, and it was this, that when there was any doubt about the justice of a case, I should lean to mercy, and it is God's will that I should recollect it now, for it fits this case as if it was made for it. That is true, said the major domo, and I maintain that like Hergus himself, who gave laws to the Lacedaemonians, could not have pronounced a better decision than the great Panza has given. Let the morning's audience close with this, and I will see that the senior governor has dinner entirely to his liking. That's all I ask for, fair play, said Sancho. Give me my dinner, and then let it rain cases and questions on me, and I'll dispatch them in a twinkling. The majordomo kept his word, for he felt it against his conscience to kill so wise a governor by hunger, particularly as he intended to have done with him that same night, playing off the last joke he was commissioned to practice upon him. It came to pass, then, that after he had dined that day, in opposition of the rules and aphorisms of Dr. Tirte Afuera, as they were taking away the cloth, there came a courier with a letter from Don Quixote for the governor. Sancho ordered the secretary to read it to himself, 
and if there was nothing in it that demanded secrecy, to read it aloud. The secretary did so, and after he had skimmed the contents, he said, It may well be read aloud, for what Señor Don Quixote writes to your worship deserves to be printed or written in letters of gold, and it is as follows. Don Quixote of La Mancha's Letter to Sancho Panza, Governor of the Island of Barataria When I was expecting to hear of thy stupidities and blunders, friend Sancho, I have received intelligence of thy displays of good sense, for which I give special thanks to heaven that can raise the poor from the dunghill, and of fools to make wise men. They tell me thou dost govern as if thou wert a man, and art a man as if thou wert a beast, so great is the humility wherewith thou dost comport thyself. But I would have thee bear in mind, Sancho, that very often it is fitting and necessary for the authority of office to resist the humility of the heart. For the seemly array of one who is invested with grave duties should be such as they require, and not measured by what his own humble tastes may lead him to prefer. Dress well. A stick dressed up does not look like a stick. I do not say thou shouldst wear trinkets or fine raiment, or that being a judge thou shouldst dress like a soldier, but that thou shouldst array thyself in the apparel thy office requires, and that at the same time it be neat and handsome. To win the good will of the people thou governest there are two things, among others, that thou must do. One is to be civil to all, this, however, I told thee before, and the other to take care that food be abundant, for there is nothing that vexes the heart of the poor more than hunger and high prices. Make not many proclamations, but those thou makest take care that they be good ones, and above all that they be observed and carried out, for proclamations that are not observed are the same as if they did not exist. Nay, they encourage the idea that the prince who had the wisdom and authority to make them had not the power to enforce them, and laws that threaten and are not enforced come to be like the log, the king of the frogs, that frightened them at first, but that in time they despised and mounted upon. Be a father to virtue and a stepfather to vice. Be not always strict, nor yet always lenient, but observe a mean between these two extremes, for in that is the aim of wisdom. Visit the jails, the slaughterhouses, and the market-places, for the presence of the governor is of great importance in such places. It comforts the prisoners who are in hopes of a speedy release. It is the bugbear of the butchers who have then to give just weight, and it is the terror of the market-women for the same reason. Let it not be seen that thou art, even if perchance thou art, which I do not believe, covetous, a follower of women, or a glutton. For when the people and those that have dealings with thee become aware of thy special weakness, they will bring their batteries to bear upon thee in that quarter, till they have brought thee down to the depths of perdition. Consider and reconsider, con and con over again, the advices and the instructions I give thee before thy departure hence to thy government, and thou wilt see that in them, if thou dost follow them, thou hast a help at hand that will lighten for thee the troubles and difficulties that beset governors at every step. Write to thy lord and lady, and show thyself grateful to them, for ingratitude is the daughter of pride, and one of the greatest sins we know of. And he who is grateful to those who have been good to him, shows that he will be so to God also, who has bestowed and still bestows so many blessings upon him. My lady the Duchess sent off a messenger with thy suit and another present to thy wife Teresa Panza. We expect the answer every moment. I have been a little indisposed through a certain scratching I came in for, not very much to the benefit of my nose, but it was nothing, for if there are enchanters who maltreat me, there are also some who defend me. Let me know if the major domo who is with thee had any share in the Trifaldi performance, as thou didst suspect, and keep me informed of everything that happens thee, as the distance is so short. All the more as I am thinking of giving over very shortly this idle life I am now leading, for I was not born for it. A thing has occurred to me which I am inclined to think will put me out of favor with the Duke and Duchess, but though I am sorry for it I do not care, for after all I must obey my calling rather than their pleasure, in accordance with the common saying, Amicus Plato sed magis amica veritas. I quote this Latin to thee because I conclude that since thou hast been a governor thou wilt have learned it. Adieu, God keep thee from being an object of pity to any one. Thy friend, Don Quixote of La Mancha.
Sancho listened to the letter with great attention, and it was praised and considered wise by all who heard it. He then rose up from the table, and calling his secretary shut himself in with him in his own room, and without putting it off any longer set about answering his master Don Quixote at once, and he bade the secretary write down what he told him, without adding or suppressing anything, which he did, and the answer was to the following effect. Sancho Panza's letter to Don Quixote of La Mancha. The pressure of business is so great upon me that I have no time to scratch my head or even to cut my nails, and I have them so long, God send a remedy for it. I say this, master of my soul, that you may not be surprised if I have not until now sent you word of how I fare, well or ill, in this government, in which I am suffering more hunger than when we two were wandering through the woods and wastes. My lord the duke wrote to me the other day to warn me that certain spies had got into this island to kill me, but up to the present I have not found out any, except a certain doctor who receives a salary in this town for killing all the governors that come here. He is called Dr. Pedro Recio, and is from Tirtiafuera, so you see what a name he has to make me dread dying under his hands. This doctor says of himself that he does not cure diseases when there are any, but prevents them coming, and the medicines he uses are diet and more diet, until he brings one down to bare bones, as if leanness was not worse than fever. In short, he is killing me with hunger, and I am dying myself of vexation, for when I thought I was coming to this government to get my meat hot and my drink cool, and take my ease between holland sheets on feather beds, I find I have come to do penance as if I were a hermit, and as I don't do it willingly, I suspect that in the end the devil will carry me off. So far I have not handled any dues or taken any bribes, and I don't know what to think of it, for here they tell me that the governors that come to this island, before entering it have plenty of money either given to them or lent to them by the people of the town, and that this is the usual custom not only here, but with all who enter upon governments. Last night going the rounds, I came upon a fair damsel in men's clothes, and a brother of hers dressed as a woman. My head-carver has fallen in love with the girl, and has in his own mind chosen her for a wife, so he says, and I have chosen youth for a son-in-law. Today we are going to explain our intentions to the father of the pair, who is one Diego de la Llana, a gentleman and an old Christian, as much as you please." I have visited the market-places, as your worship advises me, and yesterday I found a stall-keeper selling new hazelnuts, and proved her to have mixed a bushel of old empty rotten nuts with a bushel of new. I confiscated the whole for the children of the charity school, who will know how to distinguish them well enough, and I sentenced her not to come into the market-place for a fortnight. They told me I did bravely. I can tell your worship it is commonly said in this town that there are no people worse than the market women, for they are all barefaced, unconscionable, and impudent, and I can well believe it from what I have seen of them in other towns. I am very glad my lady the Duchess has written to my wife Teresa Panza, and sent her the present your worship speaks of, and I will strive to show myself grateful when the time comes. Kiss her hands for me, and tell her I say she has not thrown it into a sack with a hole in it, as she will see in the end. I should not like your worship to have any difference with my lord and lady, for if you fall out with them it is plain it must do me harm, and as you give me advice to be grateful, it will not do for your worship not to be so yourself to those who have shown you such kindness, and by whom you have been treated so hospitably in their castle. That about the scratching I don't understand, but I suppose it must be one of the ill turns the wicked enchanters are always doing your worship. When we meet I shall know all about it. I wish I could send your worship something, but I don't know what to send, unless it be some very curious clyster pipes to work with bladders that they make in this island. But if the office remains with me I'll find out something to send, one way or another. If my wife Teresa Ponsa writes to me, pay the postage and send me the letter, for I have a very great desire to hear how my house and wife and children are going on. And so, may God deliver your worship from evil-minded enchanters, and bring me well and peacefully out of this government, which I doubt, for I expect to take leave of it and my life together, from the way Dr. Pedro Recio treats me. Your worship's servant, Sancho Panza the Governor. 
The secretary sealed the letter and immediately dismissed the courier, and those who were carrying on the joke against Sancho, putting their heads together, arranged how he was to be dismissed from the government. Sancho spent the afternoon in drawing up certain ordinances related to the good government of what he fancied the island, and he ordained that there were to be no provision hucksters in the state, and that men might import wine into it from any place they pleased, provided they declared the quarter it came from, so that a price might be put upon it according to its quality, reputation, and the estimation it was held in, and he that watered his wine, or changed the name, was to forfeit his life for it. He reduced the prices of all manner of shoes, boots, and stockings, but of shoes in particular, as they seemed to him to run extravagantly high. He established a fixed rate for servants' wages, which were becoming recklessly exorbitant. He laid extremely heavy penalties upon those who sang lewd or loose songs, either by day or night. He decreed that no blind man should sing of any miracle in verse, unless he could produce authentic evidence that it was true, for it was his opinion that most of those the blind men sing are trumped up, to the detriment of the true ones. He established and created an alguacil of the poor, not to harass them, but to examine them and see whether they really were so for many a sturdy thief or drunkard goes about under cover of a make-believe crippled limb or a sham sore. In a word, he made so many good rules that to this day they are preserved there, and are called the Constitutions of the Great Governor Sancho Panza. End of chapter 51 Recording by Tricia G.